welcome to the IdeaCast interview series, episode 28. My guest today is Adam Kahane, and we'll be discussing his book, Facilitating Breakthrough. Adam is a director of Rios Partners, an international social enterprise that helps people move forward on their most important and intractable issues. Adam is a leading organizer, designer, and facilitator of processes through which business, government, and civil society leaders can work together to address challenges. He's worked in more than 50 countries and in every part of the world with executives, politicians, generals, guerrillas, civil servants, trade unionists, uh, community activists, United Nations officials, clergy, and artists. Adam is uh, the author of a number of books including Solving Tough Problems, An Open Way of Talking, Listening, and Creating New Realities. He's also the author of Power and Love, A Theory and Practice of Social Change, Transformative Scenario Planning, Working Together to Change the Future and Collaborating with the Enemy, How to Work with People You Don't Agree With, Like, or Trust. And as I mentioned, uh, we will be discussing Facilitating Breakthrough, How to Remove Obstacles, Bridge Differences, and Move Forward Together. I found Facilitating Breakthrough to be an enlightening book and an inspiring book. There are um, a lot of moments that uh, go beyond just facilitation and collaboration. It is, I believe, an effective book for personal relationships and navigating uh, the social ecosystem that we have uh, in front of us in in the 2020s. And uh, this conversation was recorded in uh, the first day of March 2022. And um, so... Uh, it's, it's a time where um, more collaboration and good facilitation uh, is, uh, is of the order. So join me in this conversation. I thank you for being, being here, and I think uh, hopefully you will take away from it uh, uh, what I got from it, which is uh, just a very inspiring conversation. So thank you for your time, and enjoy the conversation. And I'd like to welcome Adam Kahane to the IdeaCast interview series. Um, I'm really excited to have you and grateful to have you on board, Adam. Um, I've read your book, Facilitating uh, Breakthrough, and I've studied uh, the work you've done with Rio's partners and the, uh, the provenance story of how you became involved in this kind of work. And um, I'm, I'm looking forward to our dialogue. And uh, you mentioned in an interview that... Um, the world needs more collaborators, more uh, skilled facilitation. And in your book, you outline a thesis and modes of facilitation that I, as somebody who knows nothing about uh, negotiation and, and collaboration and facilitation, uh, I found very inspiring and very enlightening. So I would love to uh, go through this journey with you over the next uh, 45 minutes or so to uh, express this work uh, uh, through this video. So I will hand it over to you and, and you can start where you'd like and we'll just go back and forth on, the, uh, on your thesis and uh, what is within this book. Okay. Uh, thanks, Justin, and thanks for your, your interest and your <clears throat> careful preparation. Um, yeah, I think you've um, uh, started in the right place, which is uh, the reason for the book is uh, that the world needs more and better collaboration, and therefore the world needs more and better facilitation. And to unpack that a little bit, I think in the context we find ourselves in, the technological, political, cultural, uh, organizational context we find ourselves in, we, we're increasingly often uh, dealing with challenges that can't be successfully addressed by any one person acting alone or by any one organization acting alone uh, or by some people telling other people what to do. doesn't mean there's no room for those things, but there's less room than there used to be. So that's what I mean about the world needing more and better collaboration. And um, I'm defining facilitation uh, not as the act of uh, running a meeting or standing in front of a flip chart, or even though it may involve that, but I'm saying facilitation is about helping diverse groups uh, uh, um, work together to create change. Mm -hmm. So that's why I say the world needs more and better collaboration and collaboration needs facilitation and therefore the world needs more and better facilitation. And 
So I've written this book to try to, uh, or to offer what I understand is involved in facilitation. I've been doing it uh, all day, every day for 30 years. And uh, I've had uh, lots of trial, lots of error. And so lots of learning. And I've, I put down this book, um, what I've learned about, about what it involves. Mm -hmm. And um, one of the first ideas in the book is that most people, uh, including most facilitators, think that facilitation is about getting people to do things, mm -hmm. um, telling them what to do or manipulating them. When I give talks on facilitation, I think 100% of the time, somebody will say, well, how do you get people to come together? How do you get people to agree? How do you get people to stop talking? How do you get people to this, that, and the other thing? And um, I, I've realized that that's where the problem starts, uh, that uh, as a facilitator, uh, we really have almost no capacity to get anybody to do anything. We're not in a position of authority. Um, and so uh, what I think facilitation actually involves uh, in its essence is not getting people to do things, but removing obstacles to people doing what it is they need to do. And uh, more specifically, uh, it's removing obstacles to three things that I think almost everybody wants, which is to contribute, uh, to connect, and to do that equitably. Everybody wants to be able to give their ideas and their energy and get something going and uh, fulfill their own ambition or destiny or job or whatever. Um, everybody wants to connect to the situation, to themselves, to other people. They don't like to feel uh, uh, apart or alone. Mm -hmm. and and almost everybody wants that to be equitable for, or fair, that, that everybody involved has, has an opportunity to, to contribute and connect. So, and if I was to try to say that in a more, um, you know, with fancier words, I would say that facilitation involves removing the obstacles to power, love, and justice. Mm -hmm. I'm using these words in a specific way, but by power, I mean the drive to contribute. By love, I mean the drive to connect. And by justice, I mean uh, the drive for, for equity. So, so anyhow, that's the, that's the summary of the book. Just saved you $11.95 and no. <laughs> quite, a, quite a lot of hours. Uh, and then the rest of the book unpacks, well, okay, how do you do that in practice? Right. And one thing that I... I my there's styles of writing but i think there's also styles of perception and reading and one thing i love about a book is there are anecdotes and your book is steep with these very meaningful um uh, paradigmatic shifting uh for your what you do um insights from these anecdotes uh i can speak to uh what happened to you in manitoba what happened to you with uh clara arenas some of the people who sort of um held mirrors up to you and said you know this is a different way to insight so um, what you deliver in the book, um, and I say this as a reaction to sparing people eleven dollars and ninety eight cents. It's the book is rich, and uh, and there are so many. And again, if you're not, I'm not a facilitator. I'm not a negotiator. I, I don't know how to collaborate as as a career by any means. I I bargain with my wife sometimes. You know? But what I take away from this, and the way through my lens, is there's um, a trove of information in there that would help the average person negotiate life. Um, you even referenced it uh, in, uh, um, uh, was it Paola Melchiori's uh, definite, the feminist philosopher's definition of the, the role of the, uh, the, the domestic role of the man and the woman or, or the persons in partnership. Yeah. Um, um, I think that's a good example of the uh, broader dynamic uh, to this, yeah. to, to the salience yeah. of this book. Um, so uh, th th you say a couple of things that are important to me. First of all, um, Whatever I've come to understand about collaboration and facilitation, I've come to understand by trying and failing and trying and failing. And so I, um, maybe not everybody's like this, but I learn, the way I learn is I think things are one way and I act based on how I think they are. 
and something happens that doesn't fit with that and i uh, you know i run into a brick wall mm. and and then i say well what happened here and so almost all the stories i think maybe with just a few exceptions are times when that happened and somebody said to me well you know adam you thought it was like this but it's like that mm -hmm. and and the names of the people you mentioned were all people who <laughs> who pointed those things out to me and i i um I treasure that and I honor that. And, and so uh, I explain it that way. And it's important to me to give, to give credits where credit's due. Mm -hmm. But the other maybe more important point is that um, I have my experiences, which are in a particular realm. I've focused on a certain kind of facilitation, which isn't very, very ordinary. It involves, um, teams of leaders from across different organizations, including people who don't agree with or like or trust each other working on big issues. But it's uh, what I've tried hard to do is to explain not how to do that work, which is my work, but how this, this role of helping people work together to create change uh, is applicable in, in any situation. Uh, whether it's uh, on the global, uh, at a global level on climate change, or whether it's in national contexts such as some mm -hmm. I've been involved in, or at a community, or in an organization, or in a family, mm -hmm. because I think if you if you make the effort to get down to the essence, and I think for example, power, love, and justice are pretty close to the essence. Mm -hmm. uh, if you if you do the work to get down to the essence, it's the same everywhere. And so um, I'm trying to articulate a general theory and practice of facilitation that is applicable in, yeah, in all contexts. And one of my takeaways from having um, wrapped my head around your, what I, I call it your thesis, but it's your system that it, that's in the book. And um, it's a dynamic system because, uh, and uh, I'll again, let you do better uh, service to the explanation of these, but I'll start with the outline, and that is that you express um, uh, there is a verticality and a, and a horizontality approach to facilitation, and we could see them on a graph, perhaps, and then we could factor in uh, five questions uh, that are that are again in the book that you outline, um, and they're almost this this sort of Bayesian process where you can't rely on verticality, you can't rely on horizontality, and I'll have you explain what those are. Uh, yeah. But what I love is the fluidity and stepping away from this sort of um, binary dipole rigidity. Um, and I think, again, we just spoke to the universality of your work. It, it can be very uh, sort of convergently focused on, you know, high level uh, working with FARC and, uh, and, the, and the, the federal Colombian government or working in South Africa with the ANC and the Afrikaners, but also just in, in um, basic human relations. I love the concept of not necessarily feeling like there is these absolute binary um, yeah. poles that you have to adhere to. So that, that's attractive to me. Could you talk about verticality and horizontality? And then again, the inquiries that can revolve around that. Yeah, so um, when I was thinking about facilitation and about how it's um, commonly understood, I realized that uh, there's two common ways of facilitating, which I call the vertical way and the horizontal way. Uh, and neither of them work, or both of them have limits. Mm -hmm. And um, one uh, neat way to remember these uh, is something in English that I didn't quite grasp until I started to write this, which is the word group mm -hmm. is odd in that it is both a singular noun and a plural noun. The group is happy, the group is making progress, uh, or you could say the group are happy, the group are making progress, and they mean two different things. Mm -hmm. um, so the vertical approach to facilitation uh, emphasizes the group as singular. In other words, it says what really matters is 
the group as a whole. Um, uh, what's the group trying to do? Uh, what's its agenda? What's its job? Um, and what, what goes along with that is uh, uh, it's vertical in that the larger, the whole, it always wins over the parts. Mm. So you know you're in a vertical situation if somebody says, uh, hey, Justin, uh, that's fine, but could you be more of a team player here? Or could you leave your agenda at the door? Mm -hmm. uh, l let's get back to what we're trying to do here as a team or as a group, Justin. And that's fine. And it's, uh, uh, it, uh, it certainly has a place if we're trying to help people work together, then the whole matters a lot. But if that's all you do, then, uh, then you're ignoring or, 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 or telling each member of the group, each Justin to, to get in line. And mm -hmm. at worst, this, uh, this produces uh, rigidity and oppression. So, but I think that's the most common way of facilitating. Certainly, it was all about that. Mm -hmm. Now, the opposite approach, which I call the horizontal, says, no, no, what really matters is the plurality of the group. What Adam wants, what Justin wants, what, what Frank thinks, what Jill thinks, Jane's agenda. Mm -hmm. And the facilitator is really about helping each person express themselves and... Um, and, uh, and get what they need. And again, that's valuable, but taken too far, or if that's all you do, then you end up with everybody going in their, in, uh, in their own direction. So when I uh, expressed it that way, I realized that this is not a choice. You need to do both. And mm -hmm. something that where there's two, um, two options and you can't choose one or the other, that's what we call a polarity. And so uh, Barry Johnson has done classic work on polarities and his great example is breathing in and breathing out. You know, you don't have a committee to decide is it better to breathe in or breathe out. You got to do them both, not at the same time, alternately. And so that in summary is my idea of what's required is a facilitator who is going to succeed in helping people move forward together, who's going to succeed in removing obstacles to forward movement has to move back and forth between the vertical and horizontal, not in the middle, not choose one or the other, but do them both. And that's, the, the book is, uh, unpacks that idea of how do you work with both the vertical and the horizontal, not at the same time, but alternately as they're needed. And um, that, I may be jumping uh, subjects here a little, but, you reference Paul Tillich in the book, and you it, this has a ring of familiarity when you talk about the uh, love, power, and justice. And like I said, forgive me if I'm moving too fast no. and jumping out no, of. That's fine. We need to bracket here, but um, no, no. I, it, it to me it resonates with what Tillich was saying and what King was uh, echoing in Tillich's work that uh, you know love without power and power without love and justice, you know, they, they complement each. It's a complementarity. Yeah. And, and so I would exactly. pull, pull that. I'll come back in from my divergence and say that, that with the um, finding a harmony within the vertical and the horizontal can, can bring about that uh, equanimity or, or however you want to call that uh, in a process or, or, or it opens doors and, and removes obstacles, as you've said, uh, to, to allow that facilitation yeah. to move forward. So um, what I try to do in my writing, and I, I, I focus on this probably more than anything, is what's the, what's the essence of things? What's the simplest way uh, that you can explain something? I think this is my training as a, as a physics student. Um, you're always trying to find the most elegant way of expressing mm. why do things work the way they work. And I have worked a lot uh, with these words, power, love, and justice, uh, not because, you know, I feel like talking about that, but because I think this really explains a lot about what it's like to work with groups and in social systems. And there are many definitions of these three words, uh, but I'm using very specific definitions and they, they, uh, they come from this theologian, Paul Tillich, um, who defined power as the drive of everything to realize itself, uh, love as uh, 
the drive to unify the separated and, um, and justice as the, the form that enables uh, power and love. Mm -hmm. And so uh, obviously I'm not talking here uh, about power over or falling in love. These are different uses of these common words, but I persist in using these common words because I think if you can, if you can grasp that, then, um, then a lot of things about, about groups and social systems and helping people deal with issues becomes clear. And yes, in this sense, power and love are a polarity. Uh, and so um, Martin Luther King Jr., who studied the work of Paul Tillich, said power without love is reckless and abusive, and love without power is sentimental and anemic. So he's saying you can't choose between them, you've got to use them both, and went on to talk about justice as the structure or the form that enables uh, both power and love. So, so yeah, I'm, I mean, this is a, not a straightforward thing, but I'm saying you just, <laughs> you just have to remember three things and then, and then right. you'll be there. And I, I mean that literally that if as a facilitator, we think about how we're going to work as a group and with a group and we, we made an agenda or a plan or a, um, you know, a, a work plan or a roadmap, and we color coded it. This is the stuff I'm doing to unblock power. This is what I'm doing to unblock love. This is what I'm doing to unblock justice. I think you'd have color coded 90 or 100 percent of what you're doing. So I really do mean that if you can work with these three things, you've got it. And this, mm -hmm. again, is true uh, in countries, in organizations, in communities, in families, in couples. Absolutely. And, and for the audience, I would say, um, if there's anybody that likes philosophy out there, when we talk about love and power, um, some, as you said, sometimes that can get misinterpreted. And so there are four or five types of love. And, and I think of it as a combining of the eros and the agape, which is the agape is the sort of for, uh, forgiving love or, or a, a broad encompassing love. Eros, if you can get beyond the human uh, physicality, is, is the drawing of the attraction too. And so when I thought of your work and Tillich's work with love, it is a combination perhaps of those two where there mm -hmm. is a mm -hmm. universal love as well as a love of attraction, but it doesn't have to be the erotic attraction. It's just the attraction right. that you want to harvest or, or um, bring out uh, of that process, I think. And then going to power, uh, I watched a recent uh, talk on uh, Nietzsche's power and that gets misinterpreted and, and, and camps interpret different ways. But what I loved about the elegance of this explanation is that when Nietzsche talks about a will to power, that it is just an actual actualization of the potential of what's within yes. a system, which a system is a person's mind uh, or a group, a group uh, consensus. And so just to, just to help lay those out a little oh. bit. For people no i i mean i uh, th i think you know more about these two other um bodies of work than i do but it but yes it sounds right and they're important uh, just to spend one more minute on it because love in this sense is not romantic love but it is this it is this recognition of connection mm -hmm. that recognition that we are part of larger wholes, whether we like it or not. Um, and power is, uh, uh, yes, this, this will to self-realization, this will mm -hmm. to growth. And, and that the idea that I don't like power or I don't, or I don't think love is important. These are, these are nonsensical statements to say you, you wish we didn't have to use power that literally nothing would happen without power. And to say, right. well, I don't think love's very relevant. That's saying that um, there are no connections between people or departments or countries. Uh, and then the reason I was happy to in this book to be able to bring justice into it is because I think it's better understood than it, than it was a few years ago that if the structures we're working within, the organizational structures or the community structures or the legal structures that we're working within, don't enable everybody to realize themselves and everybody to connect, then the, the 
the impact will will be terrible mm -hmm. um and uh and uh you know and we see it in all kinds of violent um oppression um at all scales where the power of one is is denying or kneeling on the neck of another mm, quite literally yeah absolutely um, and speaking to justice, um, you were having, you were in conversation in an interview, uh, and I recommend to people watching this video that there is a lot of content uh, with Adam on YouTube. And uh, it was um, uh, the diversity, I'm probably going to get this wrong. She was a diversity chief, uh, officer with the city of Vancouver, Irf, yeah. Irfan, uh, Aftab Irfan. And she, right. She asked you a question, which I thought was interesting, and maybe we can talk about it. She said, well, you know, if the if the oppressed, if the underdog uh, gets a minute and the power broker, the yeah. power structure gets a minute, uh, is it fair? Is it not fair to give the yeah. the, uh, the oppressed a minute and a half to two minutes? And I thought I, I had to meditate on that for a while because, you know, it it I think it would. Be, you could go a couple ways with that. So the, so the people who we would say are in this sort of linear hierarchy that they have the power, um, would they be just be charitable or what, what is their uh, action there? And what is, how, how is that perceived by someone who is in a disadvantaged position? Do you want to talk about that? Because that, that yeah. left me wondering. No, it, was a, it was a great conversation and uh, I've enjoyed a lot um, talking to people in, um, uh, conversations like this, and I've <laughs> learned a lot. I think if I, if the book hadn't been published, I would go back and 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 make some changes and <laughs> clarifications. And that one that uh, uh, that you mentioned was was really important. So let me just back up a step because okay. uh, I wanted to give an example of power, love, and justice in facilitation. And the uh, and it's, I'll give you this example, and that's the one that an Aftab was uh, was reacting to. So a simple example is um, uh, often when we're uh, working with a group of people from across the system who don't know each other and maybe are reluctant to work together but think maybe they need to or they should at least try, the very first activity is the following. Um, we invite each person to to introduce themselves and to say something about why they're there. And each person is given exactly one minute. Um, and, uh, so imagine people, a group of whatever, 25, 30, 40 people sitting in a circle, uh, an empty circle, uh, nothing um, in the middle. And each of them has one minute uh, timed with a bell. So um, there are limitations to this that I won't get into now. Um, but I, I that I explain in the story about Manitoba that you alluded to, but it's a it it's often very important um, because uh, uh, the very first thing you do in a group sets the tone, and here the tone that's being set is that everybody uh, has uh, everybody's contribution is equally um, valuable, and that's different from a normal meeting where you would give the most senior person uh, five or 10 or 60 minutes to say what they want and everybody else um, doesn't say anything. So mm -hmm. in that sense, especially in very hierarchical um, contexts, this is sending a very strong signal. Mm -hmm. And it's a signal about contribution that everybody's contribution is needed. We need everybody's perspective and voice and energy in the work. It's removing obstacles to connection that when we sit in a circle, we're able to see and connect and listen to and connect to uh, everybody else. And it's uh, saying something about equity that, that, uh, that we're gonna allow contribute or we're gonna enable uh, contribution and connection by everybody equally. Now, Aftab's asked a very good question, which is that's equal, but is it equitable? Mm -hmm. If the president always gets to talk in every meeting and anyhow is, uh, has no consequences for what he or she says and, uh, and is used to speaking publicly 
uh, but the the uh, the frontline worker um, uh, who's who's usually ignored or silenced or not even invited into the meeting um, is given the same minute. That's equal, but is it equitable? And I thought it was a uh, an important point. I don't think there's a right or wrong answer, but but um, but I but I thought it was useful. And the more general point is that she was making is, or the challenge she was making is, how do you do this work in a way that that takes proper account of of power differences? Just because everybody's sitting in a circle doesn't mean that outside the room or even inside the room, they're they're being treated equitably or or with justice. So mm-hmm. how in <clears throat> facilitation are you going to acknowledge that rather than pretending and I, I don't so I thought it was a very important point it doesn't have a obvious answer but yeah. but I thought it was a very important point no it left yeah it was a good point and and like you I I couldn't come up with a good uh, good way to, to to pass through that the only thing I think that symbolically um, if you start a meeting, without the equity necessarily being there, but with the equality as a start, that um, one of the points of, one of the inroads of progress that can be made is discovering that equity and understanding yeah. power relationships. So it's almost like you get to the door, let's not, you know, so yeah, it's, it's, yeah. it's a good, it was a good challenging question. Like, again, when I was pouring through your interviews, I thought that her comment really struck a tone with me that this is such, it, I guess it speaks to a very complex, um, series of uh, scenarios and uh, individual inputs and, and, uh, and, and how, how do you navigate that. Um, so I wanted to bring that up just, just again to illustrate to people that this, this is not cut and dry, this is real time, uh, like Manitoba again, this was real time um, uh, learning and adapting and maneuvering. Uh, you, you, uh, that Manitoba incident really was inspiring too that um, you have to come in uh, and I'm sure it changed your trajectory and you have to have the humility and the, um, the humanness to, to be able to be flexible and say, no, no, this is Adam's way and this is Rios's way. And, and so if you can turn on a dime like that, I think that's really amazing. Um, and, and you would appreciate uh, the synchronicity this morning. Uh, I turned on uh, YouTube before I went off to work and um, there was a, uh, uh, a suggestion that, that, you know, the YouTube bots are very scary. They know what you watch and they, they know how to feed you stuff. But this uh, suggestion was for Ubuntu uh, philosophy and the uh, man talking about it was James Agude. And I guess he's a professor uh, in where you are in South Africa. And he was talking about the Ubuntu, uh, Ubuntu rather, philosophy, which is a collectivist uh, ideology or collectivist, I'm interpreting it this way, I, I could be dead wrong, uh, but it, it, it talks about a lot of what you're talking about here, that, that we are a collective, we are a um, species that thrives on collaboration, we're a species that thrives on communication and support. And uh, so I just thought that was inspiring that I got up this morning and I, I watched it was only, and then there was a suggestion and uh, Desmond Tutu was talking about it. So I watched that too. Uh, but that um, started my day out and uh, coming here and having this conversation with you uh, helps to, uh, to bring that into further uh, prominence for me. So, um, so can we go back to um, when we talk about vertical and horizontal and the inquiries and setting the tone for a meeting and, um, you, but any question, and you have a series of five questions, which turn into 10 questions. Um, can you talk to that for, for people who um, can understand, again, that this is a, a dynamic process and a process with yeah. points that you can move back and forth on? Yeah, so this is when it, it gets uh, a bit um, complicated. Uh, I don't think especially, di- I don't, I'm not saying especially difficult, but it's just a little complicated to explain uh, verbally, but uh, let me try. Okay. Um, what I, what I say, if you want to go into more detail than, than what we've been talking about so far is that any group that is collaborating uh, has to deal with five questions, not necessarily in this order, not necessarily once, not necessarily once and for all, uh, but over and over. And the questions are pretty ordinary questions. How do we see our situation? 
Um, so what's going on here? Um, how do we define success? Where are we trying to get to? Uh, how do we get from here to there? What's the plan? Uh, or what's the roadmap or the, or the road? Uh, how do we decide who does what? So what's the, the, what are the roles going to be? And then how do we understand our own role in the situation? Um, so th these are five basic questions. And what I um, have explained is that there's a vertical uh, answer and a horizontal answer to each of these questions. So I'll just give you one example. When, when we're dealing with a question, uh, how do we see our situation? Um, let me think what's the best example. Yeah, let me take the third one. How do we get from here to there? The vertical way of answering that question is by mapping, by saying, okay, uh, let's lay it out here. We're going to go here and then here and then here. So a roadmap or a plan. Mm -hmm. And that's very useful. Uh, until until <laughs> uh, we're no longer on that territory. The horizontal answer to that question is discovering, which is well, we're going to head out and we're going to we're going to uh, figure out how to get there uh, as we go. So both this is another polarity. It's just a uh, a particular version of the same vertical horizontal polarity, and so. The answer is the same. If you want to answer the question, how do we get from here to there? You have to move back and forth between mapping, discovering. We think this is the direction. We're going to head off there, but we're going to be alert to how it's different. We're going to adjust, and then we're going to make a new map, et cetera. So um, five questions, two poles, five times two is 10. Uh, there's only 10 moves you have to make. So I don't know what I mean. Maybe it's eight, maybe it's 14, but it's not a million. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and and so uh, I think that's a contribution to say, if you want to facilitate, you have to learn how to do 10 things, just 10 things. Mm -hmm. The difficulty is the following. I can't tell you in advance when you're going to have to use each one yeah. um, or in what order. Mm -hmm. uh, and so the practice of facilitation is learning these 10 moves. Um learning these 10 moves, advocating, inquiring, concluding, advancing, mapping, discovering, directing, accompanying, and standing outside, standing inside. Those are the 10 moves of the, the, the chart you referred to earlier. Yeah, in your put book. All this in one, big, one yeah. big chart. But anyhow, all you have to do is learn these 10 moves. And, and it's in the book yeah. for people who buy yeah. the book. <laughs> so it's yeah. not a brain strain. Um, <laughs> um, the... The challenge here is, is how do you know which move to make? By paying attention. Mm -hmm. By paying attention, not to what I wrote in the book or what I thought when I started the meeting or what I agreed with my co-facilitator or the client would, would happen, but paying attention to what's going on right now in the group, in the situation, in yourself, and deciding, okay, I'm paying attention. This is what's needed now. And that's the that's this that's what the practice is required for. I think I I facilitate a lot. I'm a pretty good facilitator. I make lots of mistakes, but I'm a pretty good facilitator. And I I would say I I don't have to think about it. I I have a sense that I need to do this now. Um, but I've been doing it for 30 years, and so this. This book gives a sort of a map. If you're in this situation, do this. And if you're in that situation, do that. Mm -hmm. It also strikes me, um, again, your book is full of um, really powerful anecdotes that uh, your example of Thailand, almost uh, one uh, instance, you have to um, almost exercise a sense of uh, cultural relativism of knowing, going into an environment where sensibilities could be different. And, uh, you know, I'm, I'm from North America, I have my sort of Anglo centric thinking, and if I go to another country, and, and it struck me that your your retelling of Thailand, um, that 
it seemed like people were uh, striving for your attention to to illustrate the rightness of their position. And so that, again, the awareness that you speak to uh, is you really have to hone that, I, I suspect, um, to be able to, to navigate those waters when you have these fo forces that are vying for um, the relevance of the uh, narrative or, or the, the command, perhaps, of the narrative. So that, that's another well, level, um, type of awareness. Yeah, I mean, that. Um, Hopefully I did that right. Way that, <laughs> no, no, I think that's that's fine and that's correct. Um, in a way, it was easy in Thailand because I knew that I didn't know. Mm. And in the particular story you're telling, I knew that I didn't know. And then when I thought back on the series of conversations, I realized that that everybody was trying to appeal to my sense of justice. And that's where I realized that even though people may have very different definitions of justice, in a certain sense, they all agree that justice is required. So that I told the story to illustrate that point. But you've been alluding to a, a, a situation in Manitoba, which for me and in the book is more is even more important. Mm -hmm. um, I'm from Canada. I live well, in Manitoba is a province in Canada. And so um, and I, uh, the, the story in that final chapter of the book is about working with a group of native Canadians, First Nations Canadians. Mm -hmm. And the mistake I made, I mean, I made a lot of mistakes, but the essential mistake I made was to assume that I knew because I was home now. And so I would understand. Mm. Uh, and, and that what I had learned elsewhere uh, was applicable here. So I was the expert. I, I had this international experience. I knew what was going on and I could just do the right thing. And they told me, you know, within about three minutes of starting that I was completely wrong and, and I had to adjust. So yeah. in a way, the interesting thing is that's the, it's when I thought I knew everything mm. that I made the biggest mistake of all. And so the, the, the more general lesson is don't assume well, you know the joke, uh, the word assume makes an ass out of you and me. So right, be, right. Careful. <laughs> be careful what you assume uh -huh. uh, because every situation is different. Every situation is particular. Sometimes it's like what you expect um, and sometimes it's not. And so that's why the most, the central lesson is pay attention. Don't get distracted by what's in the book or what, you're thinking of something else or what worked last time, pay attention. Mm -hmm. I think you referenced a, a portmanteau or a, a, a term of fasciculation. And so that you can come in with this well-meaning uh, sense of uh, covert hubris or whatever you want to call it. Like, you, you know, you can like, take command of the situation, but it may blow up in your face uh, because, like you said, your, your salience radar is not, not flipped on. So much. Oh, fascipulation uh, is a, a funny term that refers to a different phenomena. Oh, okay. <laughs> uh, that most people believe that facilitators are not trying to help them get somewhere, but are trying to manipulate them mm -hmm. on behalf of the, the agenda of the boss or the client or whatever. And so they don't trust facilitators and uh, because they think they're, they're actually trying to manipulate them. And I've often thought uh, that when I facilitate, <clears throat> I don't think I'm especially uh, graceful or always knowledgeable about the particular situation. And maybe even just in this, uh, in this interview, you, you know, I pause a lot and so I don't think my success has to do with uh, because I'm really brilliant or right. Mm. But I do think that people can tell he's trying to help us. Mm. He's not trying to manipulate us. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think that counts for everything. Absolutely. That's more important than being slick or clever or always right oh. or, or yeah. fast. And uh, I had a mentor, uh, Bill O'Brien, former president of Hanover Insurance. And he used to say to me, Adam, 
you have to realize that even the simplest person can tell if you're trying to bullshit them. Mm-hmm. Don't mm-hmm. try. Uh, everybody's got a good bullshit, bullshit radar. <laughs> yeah. uh, and so uh, don't try. Be, yeah. be honest because otherwise people won't trust you and you won't get anywhere. I, I think wisdom and humility uh, far outweigh intellectual uh, prowess, you know, again, because people could become entrapped by the, um, the, the weight of that, you know, the intellectual um, power that you bring to bear on a situation that can be overwhelming and, and off-putting again, because you're, I think, uh, you know, in, in a lot of the instances you cite in the book, you're dealing with salt of the earth people you're dealing uh, and Colombia is a good example of that. You had people coming in from the woods and, and uh, there were certainly well-educated people at the table, but there were also uh, the, like me, just a very common person uh, coming to talk. They're intelligent, but they don't have any of the formal training uh, to navigate uh, uh, serious conversations. So if you can uh, transition between academia and street level uh, people, yeah. that, that is, to me, intuitively far more effective uh, for what you're doing, I think. Well, they weren't quoting Nietzsche in the middle of the sessions, but uh. yeah, I I don't mean to, I wasn't trying to name drop, but it's just no, no, I watched no. this lecture. No, it would no is no no. I'm I'm pulling your leg, and it, yeah, and yeah. your example was very good. But yes, um, what I'm trying to do in my work is not you know write uh, PhD theses, but help people involved in a particular situation, people with a stake in the situation, stakeholders, Mm -hmm. figure out what they need to do. And often the stakeholders are not university professors or, or, um, or brilliant intellectuals, but people who are have a stake uh, from wherever they're coming from, whether they're frontline workers or, or, or farmers or or uh, business people or activists. And when you give everybody a chance to contribute, you find that everybody has a contribution to make. I remember years ago in Colombia, there was a man, a, a farmer in the group who never said anything. In fact, I'm, I, I think he couldn't read, I think maybe he couldn't read. And mm-hmm. so wasn't even following at least what was written on on the flip charts, he, he was hearing what was said and he didn't say anything. And yet there was a certain point in a meeting where everything broke down and two people got into a fight and one of them stormed off and the process was about to collapse. And I remember this man, this farmer leaving the room and talking to the person who was upset and uh, convincing him to come back. And I thought, wow. So, so there you go. There's the contribution, or anyhow, that's the contribution that's visible to me. There may have been many others that, that I couldn't see, but geez, he didn't say anything for days. And then at the crucial point, he stepped forward and did exactly what was needed, which was in that case, heal a, heal a rift in the group. Mm-hmm. So, mm-hmm. Uh, so yeah, this equitable contribution and connection. Yeah, you can't underestimate that, and and uh, and again, I think that's from what I've can gather from uh, having read your book that you and your partners um, are sensitive to that. You're aware of that. You've learned through trial and error. In fact, Manitoba had a a, a good ending, um, and perhaps we can round out because I know you have uh, a, you're on a time limit. So uh, finish up Manitoba for us, and and let us know uh, that you know um, you. Essentially, we're told uh, that you couldn't be trusted by a First Nation representative within the group um, and that you had to you had to pivot very quickly or change some things around very quickly. But that um, I think things uh, worked out in that situation uh, after uh, you were able to uh, to be to be fluid or flexible and and rethink or reposition yourself. So can you finish up Manitoba and uh, and uh, share what you wrote in the book about? things improving from that point forward. Yeah, so uh, this was a dramatic situation where I did something that didn't work, thinking I knew everything and was told very directly and very quickly that, um, that this wasn't gonna work. And yes, the, the good part of the story is I and my colleagues um, from Rios, uh, other facilitators from Rios and from the First Nations organizations we were working with, um, pivoted and changed how we were doing things and worked much better. 
so um, but there was a more uh, there was a more fundamental learn so that was a learning about pivoting but there was a more fundamental learning which was that I it didn't work for me to hold myself as from outside mm -hmm. um, that I also I, I was from some senses outside I'm not a First Nations leader I don't come from Manitoba but in other senses I was very much inside part of the system that was part of the Canadian society and the patterns of power and oppression that mm -hmm. were producing the problem we were trying to work with and the the people I was working with didn't see me uh, wanted me to acknowledge that I was both an outsider and an insider mm -hmm. and that's the final chapter in the book because I think that's the most fundamental part of all is that the facilitator or anybody trying to affect change has to be able to be outside looking in objectively um, uh, helicopter view and also understanding their own role in things and taking their own responsibility for what's going on. So, so that was a big lesson. And, and yes, that group um, made progress and has done important things in Manitoba around health systems, including mm -hmm. during the period of COVID. And I learned what I think is the most fundamental lesson of all, which is if you wanna change a system, you have to acknowledge uh, the ways in which you yourself are implicated in it not mm. outside innocent from it mm -hmm. so so yeah that's why that's the final chapter i know you said you have a a, a time schedule can you uh speak to um what you're up to if anything uh for the future what's on the radar right now uh anything you want to talk about going forward or um, you're just uh, working with uh, Rios and, and continuing what yeah. you do. Anything interesting coming up? Uh, well, I'll, uh, yeah. So writing books is, uh, is my uh, side job. My main job, uh, I'm part of a pretty big organization, Rios Partners, that does this kind of facilitation work all over the world on all kinds of issues from um, local economic development in American cities to health systems in, uh, in Manitoba to, uh, to, um, uh, to political reform in Haiti to post, uh, uh, war Afghanistan. And, um, I'm focusing a lot of my attention right now on how does all this work at a global scale on questions related to climate change, okay. um, which have the characteristic that they're not only difficult, important, but that they have a clock attached to them mm -hmm. um, where the attitude, well, we'll take as long as we need to, we'll figure it out bit by bit, isn't good enough. <laughs> yeah. So that is exercising my, my thinking and my acting um, this year as, as well as other things. Okay. Okay. Good to hear. Um, I'd like to bring you back at some point because uh, we had talked before we well, had recorded about, um, we can talk about your efforts to, uh, to get some coherence and consilience in the uh, conversation and narrative and counter narratives of, uh, of climate change. I'd really be interested in talking about that. Also, I think something else that's very critical is, uh, is the health and wellness of democracy in, uh, in, this, uh, in this planetary system and within our species. <laughs> So I always like to say so species I, uh, because that's such a humbling term. It's, it, it takes us out of our sense of superiority. So I'd, be happy to, I'd be happy to continue the conversation, Justin. Beautiful, uh, beautiful. Whenever you want, just be in touch. And uh, yes. I enjoy okay. it a lot. Thank you very much. It's Absolutely. Absolutely, Adam. And I thank you for your company. I'm grateful to you for uh, taking the time to speak with me. Uh, because again, I found your work inspiring and informative and enlightening. And I don't say that uh, lightly. I, I, you know, I do my research on my, it's almost like stalking. I stalk you for days. <laughs> if you had this strange feeling. With that, uh, with that, uh, with that. Adam, I'll, I'll thank you goodbye. so much. Thank you, Justin. Take bye care. Bye. Be well.